Welcome everyone uh, to, for a lot of you, it's maybe your first Q and A session as we do, we do these weekly. Um, today's session is about using fuel in based on your style. So I know for a lot of individuals, there's always that question about whether they need to track or not. Um, so what we're presenting here today is the ways in which you can think about using fuel in and adapt it to your style. And to be honest, like, it's still a work in progress in terms of how we want to maximize these different personas. So I think the idea behind today is to give you a thought process of how some of us use it and somehow how some athletes use it. And then I think feedback from you coming in will help us develop the program further and allow us to just continually upgrade the fuel in app to suit all different types of personalities. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name's Scott Tyndall. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Fuel In. I'm based in Australia in Sydney. Uh, I have a passion for nutrition. I originally trained as a, as a physiotherapist and then studied sports medicine and then eventually did uh, studies in uh, performance nutrition. I've worked with um, within the sport of Ironman and triathlon since 2017 and love what every athlete is doing. Uh, and I'll introduce Elizabeth. Hello, Elizabeth Inpine. Um, I recognize and know many of you. For the new people, welcome. Uh, kind of same with Scott. Uh, background, mine in um, former chemistry, biology, history teacher, and then fell into and found a love for the sports performance nutrition. I uh, like to focus on uh, female specific sports nutrition, especially things around um, overtraining, reds, um, disordered eating, and some, <laughs> some things like that. So welcome. Perfect. Okay, so today's agenda is we're gonna talk a little bit about tracking and some key considerations that you may have based on your personality type. Then we're gonna talk about um, sort of thinking about fuel in from a what we call fuel in pro to fuel in simple. And hopefully we'll have plenty of time for Q and A. And as I said, if you've got any questions during, or if it's um, bringing up some thoughts, um, then just certainly let's just have a, have a nice open chat. Okay, so the overriding uh, theme for why we created fuel in was to remove decision paralysis and make life simpler, okay, for the athletes. And that's pretty much the, the thought process or the feedback that we're getting from a lot of athletes. And just so you understand how the program works is you may see a red, a yellow, a green before, during or after sessions, but there is, there's honestly around 50 plus inputs and calculations going on for every single day and every single meal that goes in. So it, the more information you feed into the system, the smarter it gets it. Um, providing you better detail. So things like your Z scores being updated, um, your time of day of the sessions, making sure the duration of the session is correct. They're probably some of the most important factors. And then obviously your, your biometrics in terms of your dietary preferences, your um, target body weight, uh, items like that are going to be significant in improving this. And then also the in-session sort of data capture. So things like your sweat tests, and your carb capacity, which you, you will be inputting within the sessions when it's appropriate, such as what you can see there with this bike session. The more information we get with that, the more we can be specific in telling you exactly what you need to drink and exactly what you're capable of consuming in those sessions. So what we're doing is hopefully removing a lot of the difficulty about you planning your day and making it simple just so you can see the colors. Okay, so the purpose of tracking is I think from my perspective, certainly it's, it's to provide awareness. Okay. So a lot of people won't necessarily understand what they're eating or maybe not have the nutritional background or knowledge to understand exactly the amount of calories and potentially the macronutrient breakdown of that food. So when you start to get awareness of what you're eating, you're suddenly upskilling yourself to understand over time that, okay, the bagel has that amount of carbohydrates or um, the donut has this amount of fat or avocado has this amount of fat. How much of that do I need to know, need to consume in order to hit what my targets are? And then I think the second part around 
the purpose of tracking is accountability. Certainly at the start, if you've struggled with weight from either under fueling or over fueling, it provides that accountability and allows you to stay on track with what is being prescribed to you. And ultimately you're using us to provide you with nutritional information <laughs> that is based on science and to help you hit whatever it is you're trying to do. Now, the caveat to tracking is it's only as good as the accuracy. Okay, so that's really important. If you're not accurately tracking in terms of hard tracking, then it becomes fairly useless. So I think the key, key considerations for athletes in relation to tracking and where you sit on that paradigm of hard tracking to soft tracking is I think we can break it down into three key components. So psychology, motivation, and life context. So if we go from a psychology perspective, your personality type, I think is going to play a very key role in this. Are you type A or are you type B? Um, type A being very detail orientated, meticulous, um, perhaps maybe uh, a very, um, what's the word? Just very detail driven, I think is probably the best way to describe it versus type B, which might be a little bit more relaxed uh, and not and a little bit more laissez-faire in terms of their approach to life. Now, it's not that you can't switch between the two, but you may have one type of personality that is going to drive you. And that may mean that you're very much into tracking and very comfortable with that at all times versus someone who doesn't necessarily want to hard track um, all the time or at least at certain periods. I think past behaviors is a really important consideration. Something we're very aware of is that tracking can be a trigger. Um, if you've had disordered eating or an eating disorder, hard tracking can reinforce some of those, um, those behaviors and some of those triggers. So that is why we're working towards creating um, certainly this simple way of thinking about fuel in and still maximizing the ability to fuel appropriately without creating some of those triggers and then I think last thing in terms of psychology is your knowledge. Are you social media trained in nutrition or do you have higher education, nutrition knowledge? And therefore, and it can work in both ways because you could be very well educated and therefore not need to not need to track really hard because you actually understand the composition of foods and how much those foods are just by eyeballing versus someone who is potentially what I call social media nutrition trained, who actually has very little idea and actually upskilling yourself with true science or nutritional science is going to have a big impact on how your outcomes work. Oh, sorry. I'll talk about the rest. Motivation. Um, your motivation might just be health from a pure health perspective. And I think you can hard track or soft track it depending on, again, your personality type. If your focus is body composition, if you're really aiming to, you know, get your body composition in line, then probably something like hard tracking for a certain period of time to really be on top of what your caloric intake is could be beneficial. And then certainly from a performance perspective, if you're right deep in, in season and you've got key considerations around races, then I, again, I think hard tracking for a certain period of time related to performance can be beneficial but then you may pull out of the hard tracking and move to soft tracking if it's not necessarily, um, you know, you don't have an immediate race at the forefront of your calendar. And that leads into the life context. So where are you in your training phase? What are the external factors? Do you have a young family? Do you have time to track? Um, and then life demands, same thing. So, you know, where do you sit in this paradigm and where, where do you want to focus your energy either into hard tracking or soft tracking. Uh, so look at the question with respect to knowledge. Can you recommend a few books that will help? Um, the Steve, the, the issue with books is that often they become very outdated very quickly uh, because nutritional information is changing so rapidly. Um, let me have a think about that. We'll make note of that, Jonathan. If you could just make note of that, and I'll just have a think about some textbooks that have been. Uh, very influential in my training and Elizabeth I think we can you can do the same do you have any off the cuff that you would recommend straight away it I um, guess it depends just before you answer yeah. I guess it depends on how deep you want to go into the science Steve because you know I could recommend uh, James Morton's book um, I think it's exercise physiology and nutrition I think that's the title 
um, it's pretty heavy into the physiology side of things. And uh, it, it will talk, you know, a lot from a biomech. I think it's actually uh, a biomechan, a, what is it, biophysics. I'll get the title for you, but it's very much into the physiology of it all. Now, but going into your point about knowledge, right? Social media knowledge versus there's kind of a lower end and an upper end, right? So I guess you, we can decide how much we want to geek out on it, but yeah, just trying to figure sure. out, want to geek out on the right stuff, right? Not the wrong stuff, so. Yeah, <laughs> so trusted sources. So what we'll do is we can certainly share some trusted sources that we, we believe in and researchers are generally where I tend to look for my information. Okay, so ways to track within fuel in. I think the way we can think about this and Yes, I used red, yellow, green as indications. It doesn't mean one is better than the next. So it was just more I used the colors from the system. But the meal ticker might be the person that just literally sees the colors. You see that you've got a red snack, you've got your session, then you've got a, a, a yellow breakfast. And all it means is you look at that and go, okay, I know what a red snack is. Red snack for me is a piece of toast with some jam. Tick, I had that. Yellow. Okay, I know what my yellow meal is. It's overnight oats. Um, it's 60 grams of overnight oats with, you know, two scoops of protein, some blueberries, some nuts. That's my go-to. I know that's what it, it fits that meal. Tick. And all you do is tick those off. So you're not tracking any more than just acknowledging you ate the meals. And we'll get into exactly how you can define those meals um, today. But that may be as much tracking as you need. <clears throat> a lot of people do that. Some of the best athletes that I personally work with in a one-to-one -one fashion actually just use that system because they upskilled their knowledge. Initially, they tracked, they were a green meal tracker. They went down to meal ticker because they became very knowledgeable and understanding in terms of what they required. So then you have the middle person, which might be the meal builder. This is using the meals within the app Okay, and going through and going, okay, I need a red meal. You click on the red meal, it brings up a number of meals within the app. You go, I like the look of that, click that. Does it provide you with enough protein? Does it provide you with roughly the amount of fat and certainly the carbohydrates? Yes, it does. Do you need to add in some extra protein? Search within the app, extra chicken, extra uh, plant protein, tofu, Satan, whatever. Um, do I need some extra beef? Oh, yeah, I can use that within the app. That brings up my protein and fat to meet my requirements for that particular meal. I build my entire plan throughout the fuel in app. Okay. Then you go to the meal tracker person. And this is using, say, the external apps. This is using my fitness power or lose it to really be detailed in the way you approach it. And so you can you go through that and you're meticulous in that. Now, where I sit, I sit somewhere between the meal builder and the meal tracker. I use a lot of the meals within fuel in, but then if I've got a random thing that I want to use, I will use the barcode scanner in my fitness pal and scan that ingredient or scan that. And that just brings it into my day's plan. So that's how I tend to just mix and match the two meal builder and the meal tracker systems. Does everyone understand that high level view of that? Does that sort of make sense? And we're gonna get into like a little bit more detail of what you can do, how to do this. Um, and I think the really important thing with, if we talk about fuel in pro versus fuel in simple, fuel in pro doesn't mean you're like amazing or anything like that. It's just more about you're being a little bit more precise, okay? And I think the choice of using fuel in pro is based around those considerations I said you know, your timeline, uh, your psychology, and uh, what was the other one? <laughs> I should remember. And your motivation. Um, so, and you have Fuel in Pro at your fingertips at this point in time. It's not like you need to upgrade to get it. It's just, you can use it with the uh, MyFitnessPal or lose it, be very precise, use all that information and track really, really hard, okay? The high level guidelines of Fuel in Pro, record your food at the time of consumption. This is really important because often we forget what we ate. And this comes back to tracking being only as good as the tracking is um, or the accuracy of it. Weigh your food, certainly the ingredients, at least initially to accurately understand portions. You can weigh your food, 
put it next to your hand and we'll discuss the hand sizing way. Once you understand the size of food relative to your hand or eyeballing relative to your plate, you then can disregard weighing. You understand how big a steak is, how big a piece of tofu is, what it gives you. Same with grains, same with um, you know uh, vegetables, so on. But certainly if you're going to go down the tracking route, then think about weighing your food initially. Record everything that is consumed. I can't tell you how many times I've had one-to-one -one conversations with athletes and they're like, I don't understand why I'm not necessarily hitting the goals I am trying to hit, whether that's weight gain or weight loss. Certainly in the weight loss perspective, when I will ask a question and I put the cookie counts is because I might ask them, do you eat anything? Do you ever eat cookies or anything? And if there's ever a pause, then yes, there probably is the consumption of all the other things that isn't being recorded and the cookie counts, okay? It's not bad. It doesn't mean it's bad that you're eating a cookie. It just needs to be recorded so that you can then adjust other meals accordingly, okay? And I think the thing about Fuel M Pro, in terms of if you are going to use it, just remember we don't record in-session fueling through my fitness pal or lose it that is all recorded within the app okay within your um carbohydrate consumption or carbohydrate capacity section to give you that so think about the fuel within the sessions as free calories just we're only giving them to you when it's required go for it as one um female athlete who's um you know very very high performing her words to me was I was asking her about would she want to know about um, the in-session fueling being added to her daily caloric requirement. And she said, hell no, I do not want to know. Like I'm consuming, she's consuming potentially 600 calories an hour. She doesn't want to know that she's consuming an extra two and a half thousand calories a day because in her mind, she wouldn't then fuel with that amount of fuel because she'd be worried about the other calories throughout the day. So she views it as fuel. She just needs to use all that fuel in the session to fuel what she's doing at that point in time. And you can view that as free calories if you want. So it is an interesting way of thinking about that in-session fueling and not being worried about it. Don't feel guilty. It's all for a purpose. We're applying that in-session fuel for the requirements of making you go as fast as possible and fueling your performance. Jay, the question's all right at this point in time. I'm just, should I keep going? Yeah. Go ahead and okay. keep going. And, and just to highlight, Fuel and Pro is not a separate app. It's the same it's app. Just it's just a way. It. Yeah. yeah, it's just a, a method of tracking. Okay. So again, coming back, we want to make life simpler. The overarching feedback from athletes: once you get set up, once you've connected your Apple Health and your your training platform with Fuel in, it's about making your life simpler. It's about recognizing colors, recognizing your minimum requirements. And then just going, okay, it's a red meal. I know what a red meal is. It's a yellow meal. I know what that is. Or it's a green meal. I know what that is. And that's from the perspective of fuel in simple. So I think if we're talking, if you don't want to track hard, then think about it this way. Focus on being mindful of portions and types of food. So the quality of food is important. The portions are important. Focus on the minimum amount of protein that is required. And again, we're going to talk about this in subsequent slides, but I just want to bleed this in and then focus on the colors of the carbs in each meal. No hard tracking required, okay? So these are what you're starting to think about. You're just being mindful of portions, mindful of the protein, mindful of the carbs. Okay, so from a very high level rules, minimums, talk about this all the time. You see it in the app. Everyone's like, why do I have to eat so many vegetables or fists of veggies? And it's there every day, pretty much, unless you've got races or high intensity sessions coming up. Six fists of veggies. So ideally two fists in the morning, two fists at lunch, two fists in the evening. If you don't eat veggies in the morning, at, you're adding a third fist to lunch and dinner or you're having a snack of vegetables during the day, okay? Three hands of protein. Again, there's an asterisk there. This is going to be the absolute minimum that you consume in a day for all athletes. That's all you're thinking. Again, think about two pieces of fruit per day. There's about 20 grams of carbs in there. But try and add fruit into your diet. It's very important from a micronutrition perspective, from a fructose perspective to replenish liver glycogen as quickly as possible. It also tastes great. And I don't want people feeling guilty about fruit. Fruit will not make you fat, okay? 
whatever you might hear on social media, fruit will not make you fat. Okay, so there's you're upskilled already. You, you can tell anyone that bananas are bad for you. You can tell them to go away. <clears throat> and then I think the last thing from a minimum, you know, high level rules, think about your omega-3s. We know through the research that people under consume omega-3 fatty acids. I think from a very simple perspective, you're either having one serve of omega-3 and looking at the back of the label for the capsules, you want to aim for around 3000 milligrams of EPA DHA, ideally probably around 1500 to 2000 milligrams of EPA, ideally. Now, again, you could supplement that or uh, switch that over with half a hand of oily fish. Um, if you have the sort of sardines or uh, mackerel uh, and what's the other one? Um, pickled herring. If you choose to eat those, and I bang on about these all the time, if you choose to eat those, you can probably give the pills away for that day. Okay, so then we talk about protein. We just mentioned then that the minimum amount of protein you're thinking about having is three hands of protein a day. So that's roughly 120 grams of protein. Now, if you're an athlete who is between 150 and 200 pounds, add an extra hand of protein. If you're over 200 pounds, as an absolute minimum, add another two hands. So if you don't get all your protein in, don't panic. The minimum amount you should be aiming for is three hands of protein a day. Keep in mind, if you're under, a, say you're 100 and less than 150 pounds and you're like, how do I get my protein in? you can have one of those hands of proteins as a shake. So one shake could be one of those hands and therefore you only need to get the rest of those hands of protein in in the day across your three or four meals. So what's really important to understand is that a plant protein, whilst it's not any worse than a, an animal source or a whey protein, the volume of protein you require will be a little bit higher due to uh, the... Uh, the value of the amino acids, okay? So a plant protein generally will have um, a lower quality, should I say that? Um, the bioavailability of a plant protein is slightly less and you often have less protein per serve. So it's often important if you are a vegan or a vegetarian athlete to eat more of that protein source in order to get the amount of protein that you require. So if you're having a shake, aim and you're using whey protein one and a half scoops will give you around 40 grams of protein if you're using a plant protein and i've just put in two examples of the type of protein this is from true protein in australia you can use momentous in america two plant two scoops of the plant protein um, will give you roughly one hand or 40 grams of protein okay and just to reiterate a hand of protein is roughly 40 grams of protein Okay. Does anyone have any questions on that at this point? And I know it's not as simple as just meat, chicken, fish, tofu, seitan, temper, a lot of other ingredients, pulses, grains, breads, they all contain protein. Okay. This is the high level perspective of just getting athletes to think about increasing their protein intake in a very simple way. A lot of this is detailed in the PDFs as well. Scott, I think you mentioned uh, one um, one hand, but uh, whey protein. But uh, do you suggest not doing more than that, or could you have more than that uh, with okay. the whey protein? Yeah, yeah. I think. Sorry, and just say your name when you um, ask the question. Oh, Luke. Luke. So, look. I think if you're a really big athlete, say if you're um, okay. Let's put it in the perspective of if you choose to have overnight oats in the morning because you've got, um, you're either having a small amount of overnight oats as a red meal, a larger amount of overnight oats as a yellow or a very large serving of overnight oats with maple syrup and making it a green meal, would I suggest that you add at least one scoop of protein to that or one and a half scoops of protein to create a hand of protein? Absolutely. Could you then have a shake in the afternoon? If, if that's the only way you're going to hit your protein requirements, then yes, you can do that. All I'm saying is don't rely on the supplement to hit your protein intake. I don't think that's a very healthy way of going through your daily nutritional requirements. I think you should be focusing on food first and foremost, but as we always say, it can't just be food always. A lot of the cases 
supplements can complement your diet. Think of them as complements to hit your nutritional requirements. Uh, if you, I mean, if anyone wants to listen to a fascinating podcast that was just on recently, it was Peter Atia with Don um, Don Turley, I think his name is, who's a a, a researcher and a scientist in uh, protein and protein availability and consumption. I mean, he was talking about the average person getting like 60 grams of protein a day in America. So when you look at what you require as an endurance athlete, and we're talking, you know, two, 2.5 times the recommended daily intake from a World Health Organization, then you're going to need to really focus on your protein consumption in order to get that up. Using a whey protein supplement or a plant protein supplement is a very easy way to top up your total protein intake. Does that make sense, Luke? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Cool. Um, we did touch on vegan and vegetarian. Um, I think it's absolutely fine. Like being a, being a vegan, being a vegetarian, the only thing I would say is you just need to eat more. And so this can become problematic for some of the smaller athletes who are vegans or vegetarians because you physically just can't fit the food in. So um, you often need to consume more food and then you often need more of the protein um, containing foods because the bioavailability of those certain amino acids is a lot less than animal products. So um, you will have, I think it's around, and again, in that podcast, Don talks about this, it's around a 40% bioavailability compared to a higher percentage uh, for animal type proteins. Um, they also have reduced amounts of certain amino acids, in particular leucine, which is a key trigger for mTOR, mTOR being uh, the key trigger for muscle protein synthesis. So again, and you will hear this on social media, plant protein isn't as good as animal protein. It's not necessarily the case. It's just you need to eat mixed sources of plant proteins in order to get all the available amino acids and you need to eat more of them. And as you can see here, you know, you've got, most of them will be very carby proteins. So this is sometimes where, again, for a lot of vegan or vegetarian athletes, they'll often very much over consume their carb intake relative to their protein intake. And this is where using a supplement can be very beneficial or using something like Satan, um, uh, and temper and tofu can be really effective ways of boosting that plant protein quality. Um, so it is just something to keep in mind and talk about. And certainly if you are a vegan or a vegetarian athlete, I think it's certainly worthwhile having a, a Elizabeth is highly trained in working with vegan and vegetarian athletes. I think having a consultation with her one-on-one -on -one is invaluable and all the athletes say that. Um, and certainly I'm open to having those conversations as well. It's not my area of expertise, but I certainly understand the requirements. So then if we come into carbs and carbs is what the program's built around and probably I should have probably had this slide before the protein one, but just think about like, you know, from a very high level perspective, you're trying to hit six fists of veggies a day. They're going to be your red meals. Okay. Lots of red meals. Every meal should ideally contain a fist, two fists of veggies. Now, if it's a yellow meal, you're topping up with cupped hands. So this is where you're now starting to bring in some rices, some grains, some root vegetables, bread, pasta, okay? Small amounts, but just top up the amount of carbs in that particular meal. If it's a green meal, you're just boosting the amount of carbohydrates that you're putting in, okay? Same from a high level, you're trying to bring in two pieces of fruit that's going to be one red snack, okay? Um, there or thereabouts. If you have two pieces of fruit and you count that as one red snack, it's fine. You're not going massively over. It's just you're consuming some good quality food that's going to provide you with a lot of micronutrition as well as good quality carbohydrates. And so the 30,000 foot view of the carb colors, what is red? Okay, it's two fists of veggies with pretty much there or thereabouts, one cup of hand, one cupped hand of grains, root veg, rice, a piece of bread, some pasta, piece of fruit. Okay, two fists of veggies will only give you roughly around 10 grams of carbs. So just remember that unless you're eating a hell of a lot of vegetables, you're not going to get the full amount of 30 grams of carbs. Okay, 
you can you can eat more than two fists of veggies if people want to eat six you know eight ten twelve fists of veggies a day go for it you just might get uh, fatigue of vegetables very quickly so don't be afraid of adding in you know breakfast in the morning two fists of arugula a piece of whole grain wheat toast um, with your eggs with whatever else you're eating you come to yellow two fists of salads and veggies and then two cupped hands of grains root veg rice bread fruit or pasta okay you're just adding you're just adding a layer to it and then if we come to green think about it this way i've got plus or minus two fists of veggies because if we're telling you to reduce fiber and minimize the total amount of fiber coming into those days leading into an important race um sorry an important training session or a race then you're probably going to reduce the two fists of veggies and just bump up the amount of refined or higher glycemic type foods. So again, you're going to be using probably more rice, more bread, more pasta, more fruit, maybe dropping off the grains a little bit and just really keeping the fiber and FODMAP section down, but boosting up the total amount of carbs. So you see the colors and that's all you're thinking in your head, red, yellow, green. I know that it's lower amounts of carbs, moderate amounts of carbs, high amounts of carbs. It's that comes, qu question yep. on going back to fruit. Is there good or bad fruits or are all fruits okay? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, and Elizabeth, I'll let you jump in on this one. I'll give my two cents. I, I don't think there's any bad fruits. Um, I can't think of a bad fruit off the top of my head. The only consideration with fruit might be FODMAPs. Okay, so FODMAPs are carbohydrate sources that ferment in the large intestine um, that can cause symptoms or signs or symptoms of what my, most people might think of it, irritable bowel syndrome and stuff like that. So they may increase flatulence, they may give you diarrhea, they may cause burping, may cause cramping, bloating, um, things like that. So some fruits will contain certain types of carbohydrate that when consumed in large quantities can cause individuals to have signs and symptoms. So I wouldn't necessarily call them good or bad, but they could be irritable. So in that case, and if you do suffer from those signs or symptoms of that, um, I would firstly, again, recommend maybe having a consultation, but downloading as an absolute minimum, there is a, a very, very good app from Monash University uh, called the Monash University FODMAP app. I think it costs about $10. It will honestly be one of the best $10 you'll ever spend if you do suffer from GI complaints um, because you will start to realize that something as simple as garlic or onion, which are not fruits, but obviously um, are very known triggers for that. Uh, dates, dates are in most bars and you know lower quality <laughs> nutritional supplements because um, they're cheap they're often they i think they contain a lot of uh, polyols uh, and and fructose so they can often cause irritation as well so it's not that they're good or bad they may just affect the individual in a particular way your thoughts elizabeth you pretty much summed it up okay. uh, i absolutely like it's one of my pet peeves when people could, like make fruit the bad guy uh they're fantastically high in vitamins minerals they're filling, they're like an excellent flavor addition to salads, to like meat dishes as some kind of chutney. Um, the FOD uh, map one that you're talking about, those are like apples, apricots, pears, um, figs, uh, some people mangoes. So again, that's definitely something to look into um, if you know that there are some that cause issue. Um, and I think that there are time, there's a time and a place for all of the fruits. Obviously some like bananas are higher in carbohydrates, uh, than something like an apple or a watermelon. And, you know, it's, there's a place and a time for all of them. They're excellent. Uh, please don't, please don't leave them out. Yeah. And I, I think on that, like, and, and something as simple, like everyone eats blueberries or a lot of people eat blueberries for, you know, antioxidants, polyphenols and whatnot, um, anti-inflammatory purposes but blueberries so a lot of the yeah. the fodmaps come down to the volume of the food consumed as well so uh, blueberries are in fodmap 
uh, and can cause triggers, but so it's based on the volume of the blueberries. So this is a really important learning for a lot of individuals is how much of a particular ingredient can you consume without causing issues as well. So it's something just about upskilling yourself and learning. Um, and then the final part is around fat and fat is one of those really tricky things. Like I know in the, in the um, PDF, we talk about thumbs of fat and it, it's a way of looking at things like nuts and avocado and oil as a general way of trying to quantify it, but it's, it's not perfect. And I keep trying to think of different ways of, um, you know, quantifying fat intake. And I think the overriding thing with fat is firstly, be mindful of all your food portions because most foods will contain a level of fat. Now fat is pretty much always found in proteins and carbs, but fat ingredients don't always contain protein and carbs. And so I know that's a little bit of uh, it gets in your mind a little bit, but put it this way. If you're eating a lot of avocado or a lot of olive oil or a lot of coconut oil, it will give you a lot of fat, but it won't give you any protein or carbs. The reverse could be said about like, if you looked at those pulses um, we put for the vegetarian and vegan, fat is found in all of those, but there is also a significant amount or a decent amount of protein and carbs. So um, you're thinking about those food products in that way. So when you are adding like if you've got your meal in front of you, say you're an omnivore and you're eating a steak and you're eating your, you've got broccoli, beautiful grilled broccolini and half an eggplant grilled. And you're sort of like, okay, I've got the great red meal here. And then on top of that, you chuck, um, you know, three tablespoons of olive oil over the, the broccolini and you add in a big handful of almonds and half an avocado. you you've blown the total caloric intake out on that meal with, even though you've added a lot of healthy ingredients, you've just increased the caloric amount of that meal to probably well in excess of what you needed. So avocado is a, a great food. Just be mindful it's very caloric. So you may need a quarter of an avocado as opposed to a whole avocado. Um, you may need 15 almonds, you know, a decent handful of almonds as opposed to the whole bag. Um, olive oil, you may want to use an olive oil spray instead of uh, olive oil out of uh, a glass bottle, or at least measure or understand how much olive oil you're putting on. Certainly, I would recommend you remove coconut oil. Um, and I know this is probably a big reversal or probably a big like what? Um, I think if we look through anecdotally, what we see with people who consume high amounts of coconut oil, and I'm not talking refined MCT oil, I'm talking coconut oil, it will adversely affect your lipid profile. I'm not saying everyone it does, but I can tell you now, having viewed hundreds of, of athletes' uh, blood data, that if their HDL and their triglycerides are up, it's generally that they're consuming high amounts of coconut oil, either as cooking oil or in uh, supplements or in products that consuming on a daily basis, we remove the coconut oil and slowly over time, their lipid profile tends to improve. So it is something to consider. Um, and I think in terms of fat, like we talked about, you can include that fish um, as your fat, as part of your fat and just be mindful of that. The fish oils is part of your fat as well. Um, I think if you're taking in fish oils, it'll be around five grams of fat into it. Um, and that hand of fish can be one of your hands of protein. So that's a really nice way of, again, I would love for everyone to eat one piece of fish a day. Um, you have three main meals in the day, fitting in a piece of fish in one of those main meals. It's not as hard as it sounds. Um, and I, I certainly would encourage people to eat more fish. Um, certainly the types of fish need to be considered. Don't go and eat tilapia every day because it's, uh, grown in mass factories and it's not very nice. Um, be mindful of the salmon you're choosing. If it is farm salmon, be aware that it can contain some contaminants um, that aren't necessarily great if you're consuming it uh, every single day of that same fish. Try and choose wild caught fish where possible. Certainly aim to choose smaller oily fish where possible, sardines, mackerel, uh, kippers and uh, herring. 
Uh, and that's all I have to say about that. Um, so we're going to get into some questions. I've actually finished with time to spare, which is amazing. Um, at the end of this session, there will be, when you click end, there will be a pop-up for a short questionnaire. We really value um, feedback from athletes and certainly in relation to what we're talking about here, we definitely have a roadmap for where we want to go with the app in terms of making it simpler uh, so that athletes can enter in their information in that soft tracking manner. So if you've got ideas, if you've got feedback about this session, was it simple? Was it complicated? Um, you know, I'd love to hear that and just hopefully, you know, we can build on this. Um, okay, shall we go through, let's go through questions? Yeah, there's a few I can read out, Scott. So from Libby, best pre-workout red snacks. Hold on, are we starting from the top? Yes. Okay, I just saw the RIP barcode scanner. Um, I used it today and I don't have the premium one. So I don't know about that. Everyone was telling me the barcode scanner is gone, but you can still use the barcode scanner on the free MyFitnessPal. I don't know. Maybe it's an Australian thing. How? I sorry. Is it Quack? Quack? Anyone? Sorry. Who who provided that question? I think you're. On yeah, the, yeah. You pronounced like, it right. It's Quack. 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 Yep. Um, did you, yeah, I used it today and I'm on free. So, um, I don't know, maybe it's an Australian thing versus an American <laughs> thing, but yeah, look, it, it's something we've We're talked trying to about. Get the American money. If we, um, if we can bring a barcode scanner into fuel in, if everyone says that would be amazing and everyone tells us, then maybe we'll try and fast track that. But, uh, yeah, I, I would love a barcode scanner in fuel in. I think it would make life very simple. So I can hear my tech team going, don't say that. Um, so yeah, anyway, um, the, let the me know if, if people are finding that the barcode scanner has gone. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll work around it. And Luke, okay. who's it has a barcode scanner as well. It's another app that we also integrate with. So I'll ping the uh, link to it in the chat. Yeah. L Lose It is very good, I think. Well, Jonathan, do you want to talk about how Lose It is a little bit better in terms of the integration, um, just how it shows up in the app? Yeah, the data comes through differently from MyFitnessPal, where Lose It, you'll see the individual items that you log will actually come through, the macros will come through. And it's out of our control. It's really how they send it over to Apple Health. So something to consider or experiment and see if you prefer that versus MyFitnessPal. Okay, uh, Rebecca, um, do you check off even if you didn't hit that type of meal? I think it's one of those ones. Look, if you are going to use that, just checking off the meal, I think, again, it's it's a way of being accountable. And if you go to yourself, maybe leave it unchecked, knowing that you ate the meal, but you didn't quite hit it. So therefore, it's the reminder. You didn't quite hit whatever it was. Maybe it was the protein, maybe it was the carbs. And so you go, okay, I've got to, in order to hit my next meal, I've got to hit a little bit more in this once you hit that within the lunch say tick that off tick off your breakfast and then you know you've you've been you've achieved your sort of goals in terms of what you were trying to you know eat does that does that make sense for you rebecca yep cool okay um is fuel in pro different than fuel in no so yeah stephanie it's just we were just talking about it as like it's sort of, I think ideally where we're heading with this is that you can actually switch between simple and pro. So we ideally just have hands of protein. And again, I'd love feedback on this from everyone. Like, do you think it would be useful to actually just have like the number of hands of protein, the number of pieces of fruit to hit, the number of cupped hands, um, you know, to hit in the day versus hard numbers around you know 200 grams of protein or 300 grams of carbs so things like that is things that we're thinking about um obviously in the questionnaire at the end if they're things that you think would be useful then please let us know um so Matt, can you show a recording in session fuel uh to do, what did, lauren just explain what you mean Lauren, I think you're on mute still. 
still here. Is Lauren still on? I can't see her. Okay. Lauren's not on at the moment. Um, we, we can do the in-session fueling and how that works. I think for a lot of athletes, you understand how to do that. Does everyone understand how to get or why you would do in-session fueling? Um, I think the simple question, I'll show you how, actually, I'll just go back a screen. Uh, there. Okay, so you can see on the bike, oh, no, you can't see on that one. You should say on that one. So see the run here? It says down the bottom, log sweat and log carb data. So you would uh, just hit the plus button at the bottom. That would bring up a screen that says log sweat and carb data. You select that and then input all your, your fluid consumptions through the sweat test section. It would then ask you if you wanted to add any carb data. You then add your carb data in all the products that you consumed. Very, very straightforward. We can certainly do a video on that and let you know. Um, okay, so I've answered that for you, Noah. Does that make sense? Got it. Cool. You can also go into the athlete section at the bottom right of the app, tap on that. And there's, if you scroll through, you'll see how many sweat sessions you've done on the bike and the run. You'll also see how many carb sessions you've done on the bike and the run. And that's what I was talking about at the start. The more data you input, in the more that you'll see like what your carb capacity is in terms of uh, grams per hour, grams per kilo, uh, in terms of your sweat rate, how much fluid you're losing, how much fluid you're taking in, how many milligrams of sodium and whatnot. So you'll get that as you go. Um, but, but, but protein target, type sauce shake burger, but don't make that every rebecca do you want to just ask your question oh i think you were just explaining earlier like uh protein shakes can be good to help you hit your target so i guess i'm very like new to this tracking and meal planning thing so um it sounds like it's better to have like a second shake in the day than to like not hit your protein target yeah, and, and you see at the end of the day, at the very end of the day, I have like, uh, we have a, a message that says um, snack and it says a protein shake late in the evening. So consuming a protein shake pre-bed can be beneficial, especially if training volume and training in load is very high. So there is good evidence to show, especially with slow digesting types of protein, things like casein can be very beneficial in reducing total catabolism so protein putting you into a catabolic state which is a breakdown state so it can offset some of that um i think that's when we're talking about athletes in very high training volume high training load i think in your case if you've just missed your protein target then consuming a scoop of protein or a couple of scoops of protein mix it in with a frozen banana or something like that blend it up in a in a vitamix or a nutribullet you can make it into sort of a protein dessert. Um, and that's a way of just getting there. As I said, I think to Luke, what I don't want athletes relying on is protein supplementation to hit your protein targets. I think that's, it's just not a healthy way to be thinking about protein. I think you, you rely on the protein supplement to top up is probably the best way of thinking about it. Yeah. And I guess similarly on the other example, like I saw in the doc, like a burger is not like a great type of protein, but it sounds like if you're at a restaurant and you have like a no protein or like a burger protein, then it would be better. And you need that amount. It'd be better to go the burger route in terms of food. Yeah. I think, <clears throat> you know, it, in terms of the way we map that out is like based on the protein quality. So, you know, is something like, um, from a plant protein perspective, uh is it as good quality in terms of the amino acid profile as something like a chicken breast or whey protein no it's not but it's certainly you just need to eat a bit more you then go down that route and i think it's things like bacon burgers they're not as good quality as say especially when you're eating out if you make it at home it's probably as good but it's just that level of like okay what what do i have at my disposal and what can i eat if you've only got burger and that's your only option, then you go for it and just know that that's where you are. Um, hopefully there's something on a restaurant menu that is something like some chicken or fish or something like that, unless you're at McDonald's. Um, 
the Monash University app is in the chat for anyone who wants to look at that. Is fructose not an ideal energy source if a person is FODMAP sensitive? No, it, it uh, quack, it's, um, fructose can just cause sensitivities in the gut. So it's not that it's good or bad. Again, the total amount and the type of ingredient could be the thing that just sets you off. So what you will see is a lot of these products, um, certainly gels, blocks, chews, and drink carbohydrate drinks that you're using uh, in in session fueling will have a degree of fructose in it, whether it's a two to one or whether it's a one to point eight, or if it's maple syrup, it's a one to one glucose to fructose. They're going to be in there. So again, those types of products that you're consuming, it's important to practice that and make sure that they're not causing any of these GI complaints, especially with the run off the bike. So fructose is. Um, super important in terms of replenishing liver and muscle glycogen very quickly. Um, we know that something like sucrose, which is table sugar, which is a one-to-one -one, um, molecular structure of glucose and fructose will replenish much faster than glucose alone. So I think in that you do want to use fructose. Um, and again, you'll hear things about high glucose, high fructose corn syrup and stuff like that being bad for you. Again, you're doing this for a purpose. We're not saying consume huge amounts of fructose if you don't have the need to do it. But if you certainly need to replenish glycogen stores because you've got high training volume and high training load, then certainly think about that. Maynor, you had a question? Hey, Scott, how you doing? Maynor here. Yes, I got a yeah, question. Hey. I got a question. Is any way to know how in advance we should eat high carbohydrate meals before we do the session. Say the question again. Okay, so my question is, is any way to know how in advance we should eat the food before we do like the session, like training session? So like you mean the actual, before. the actual, okay, two hours. Yeah. So I think if it's a morning, if it's Saturday or Sunday and you're doing like your race practice type sessions, then I think certainly trying to eat sort of around two hours before would make sense because then you're trying to mimic what you would be doing in race situation. I mean, races, you're generally eating three hours before, but I think if you can eat something like two hours before or 90 minutes before, it makes sense. There is value though in eating very close to the actual training session. That's a form of gut training in itself. It changes the perception of the brain to the gut uh, because you're very full and still exercising at max capacity or at a certain uh, percentage of your VO2 max. So it's, it's an individual choice. I think if you struggle with feeling very full, then certainly push out the meal window, eating window. If you don't struggle, then you can eat fairly closely to the meal. I don't personally struggle with um, eating very close to going for like on a run. I could eat probably 10 to 15 minutes before I go out and feel comfortable. Elizabeth's shaking her head because she can't do that. <laughs> Even though if it is like a 45 minutes and high carbohydrate meal. If it's a 45 minute session. And I'll be like, can I eat 45 minutes before the session? Even yeah. though it is a high carbohydrate meal. I don't yeah, have yeah. to wait like a two hours to like process the food or something. No, you'll see rises in blood glucose. I mean, the only thing about that 30 to 45 minutes might, you might get this rebound hypoglycemic type effect where you get a sudden crash in blood sugars. But so that's probably around 20 to 30, somewhere of 30, 40 minutes before, which is why you either eat immediately before or say maybe push it out to 60 plus minutes before. It's sort of that window of 30 to 45 minutes before a session can sometimes cause a drop in blood sugars um, before athletes. But again, it's individualized. So if you don't suffer from that, then I wouldn't worry about it. All right. Thank you. Is that, you agree with that, Elizabeth? Like, is that how you sort of approach yeah. it? Yeah. Absolutely. Cool. Great. Um, Thank you. Cool. Heidi, um, tracking supplements at the moment, it is, again, it's one of those things we, it, we're going to build in um, a specific to the time of day um, at the moment, just, you know, mentally keep note of things that you should be having. I think in your shake, it's tracking it. You've got your creatine, your glutamine within your shake. If you're having that shake, you know, you're getting your way, your creatine, your glutamine in um, things like your, your collagen. If you want to add that into the shake and you're consuming the shake, then you know, you're getting it. 
fish oils is one of those ones where it should just be, I mean, I don't track my fish oil consumption. I just know that I have it every day. I have it every morning. So, um, but I, it would, it would be a really nice look again, if athletes want that type of detail and you think it would be valuable to, you know, be prompted when to take certain supplements like magnesium in the evening, creatine with your shake, fish oils in the morning. Um, if you, if athletes see value in that, please provide that in feedback at the end. And Scott, I'm thinking just for an immediate fix in the app under the recipes, we could put AM supplements and PM supplements, yeah. and then athletes could just uh, select that just so they know mentally that they've checked those boxes. Yeah, it's a good idea. Um, I'm just conscious of time. If training volume is low or recovery type of phase, is creatine and glutamine an appropriate supplement? Creatine, definitely. I would just take five grams every day. In terms of glutamine, glutamine is one of those supplements that can is a conditional essential amino acid, meaning that when it becomes depleted, the body can benefit from um, consuming it uh, exogenously or through you know external sources. If you suffer from a lot of GI issues, high doses of glutamine can help with tightening the junctions in the gut lining. That is why we recommend glutamine. So if you don't, if you don't have high training volume and you don't suffer from GI complaints, then potentially you could remove the glutamine from those days. If it is something that you suffer with, I would certainly bump up the amount of glutamine that you're taking in. Um, <laughs> we've got so many questions here. I'm, I personally can't answer all of them now because um, I've actually got to jump on an athlete call. Um, maybe what we can do, we can put all these questions into um, maybe another session and we can just do an ask me anything um, to Elizabeth and I, and we can just make it very practical around all these questions because they're fantastic questions. And a lot of them, every athlete has the same questions. So um, is that okay with everyone? It's probably a bit of a like, whew, that's a lot of information anyway. So uh, you probably need to take back and, uh, and just sort of, yeah, and then this recording will be live, so you can go back over it. Um, we can we can share particular slides if that's something of interest to the athletes as well, um, and and we can share the PDF if that's interesting to you. Uh, I would personally like to thank everyone for <laughs> hearing me babble for sixty minutes. Sorry, it's, uh, a lot of talking and probably not enough questions or talk from everyone, but. Um, yeah, I think it's a really exciting way in which we're moving with this because we do, like Elizabeth and Jonathan and myself all talk about this, that there is, you know, there's a certain subset of population that either tracking is not very good from a health perspective in terms of it can be quite triggering, but certainly also from a fatigue aspect, I think, um, you know, just having a break from hard tracking, but still following this, the program in a simplistic way brings a lot of value. Uh, to the athletes and certainly to us. Okay. okay. Uh, so I, I will stay on. This is Jonathan. I'll stay on if anyone has any issues or uh, questions about the app itself. And cool. so, yeah. Okay. So feel free to hang on if uh, you have any questions about the app. Okay. Thank, thank you so much, everyone. I will jump off. Great group. Bye-bye.